these times uh, during covid when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evenings aaj pandemic mein hum digitally the political festival kar rahe hain aur mujhe lagta hai कि हमारे सामने श्रोता नहीं है हम आपस में बात कर रहे हैं लेकिन उस फील को उस उमंग को महसूस कर सकते हैं कि हजारों लाखों लोग हमसे जुड़े हुए हैं हमको सुन रहे हैं और कहीं ना कहीं कोई सार्थक हस्तक्षेप हो रहा है पीपल हु केम ऑनलाइन टू व्यू एंड लिसन टू आर इनक्रेडिबल स्पीकर्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड वी वर एबल टू कंटिन्यू इन आवर ट्रेडिशन ऑफ इंश्योरिंग द फ्री फ्लो ऑफ नॉलेज एंड इंफॉर्मेशन Welcome to Jaipur Literature Festival digital series on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts. We welcome you to this new online series, 2021. We're delighted to be celebrated World Unity Week and have with us Ben Bowler, Executive Director, Unity Earth. Hello, this is Ben Bowler from Unity Earth, and I'm honoured to be here with you in the Jaipur Literature Festival. I want to wish our friends at Teamwork Arts and everybody attending a magnificent event. We are so excited to be partnering with Teamwork Arts and many other global organisations to be bringing you World Unity Week this year, June 19 to 26. We have Vandana Shiva, Deepak Chopra, Jane Goodall, and many other incredible contributors. Come and find us at WorldUnityWeek.org. And in the meantime, have a magnificent Jaipur Literature Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben, and all of our colleagues at Unity Earth. Thank you for spreading the message of the Jaipur Literature Festival digital series. Today, we present the climate of history in a planetary age in association with the University of Chicago Delhi Center. Professor Dipesh Chakraborty in conversation. with Dr Homi K Baba academic and author the page chapter about his latest book the climate of history in a planetary age argues that the impact of climate change dismantles deeply ingrained ideas of history modernity and globalization steeped in historical and philosophical research the narrative encourages us to view the human condition from a planetary and global perspective to truly understand the changing realities of our times in conversation with professor baba the peace chakrabarty discusses the implications of the anthropocene and the way forward the peace chakrabarty is a lawrence a kimpton distinguished service professor of history and south asian languages and civilizations at the university of chicago he is the recipient of the 2014 toynbee prize which is given to a distinguished practitioner of global history Professor Homi K Baba is the Anne F Rothenberg Professor of Humanities in the English and Comparative Literature Departments at Harvard University. He was founding director of the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard University and the director of the Harvard Humanities Center. Baba is the author of numerous works exploring post-colonial theory, cultural change and power, contemporary art and cosmopolitanism. His works include Nation and Narration and the Location of Culture. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the climate of change in a age. Professor Dipesh Chakravarty in conversation with Dr. Homi K. Baba. Homi, over to you. Thank you, Sanjoy, and I want to thank the whole JLF team, which are always so supportive and so remarkably. um uh, elegant in setting up these events thank you very much for giving us this platform dipesh uh, my dear dear friend it is always a pleasure to be in conversation with you and i'm glad that recently we found many such opportunities let me just say a few words about this remarkable book the climates of history in a planetary age is a profound inquiry into the conditions and consequences of climate change in our own time and in time to come as a historian with philosophical and literary interests debesh's work on climate change is engaged with historical time the knowledge we have of the experience of the past but it is engrossed with virtual and conceptual time what i'm calling the time to come 
The time to come cannot be experienced, but it is a compelling experiment with the science and the sensibility of living beyond our means at the limits of our knowledge and imagination. One of the significant lessons of Depeche's inquiries into climate change suggests that human beings are living beyond the means of planetary survivability. They're abusing the very resources of the life that brings them at the center, to the center of living. Prediction, projection, calculation, contingency are essential measures of future thinking. But Depeche's exemplary exp experimental work unsettles the traditional historian's commitment to the lived experience of the past. The page delves into the deep time of planetary biodiversity that reaches beyond and stretches before anything we can realistically claim to be our historical consciousness of lived experience. How then do we commit ourselves ethically and philosophically in the historical present? to the precarious futures of life and death that climate change will bring to, to generations yet to come. Are these almost beyond our imag human imaginings? Depeche's work poses the crucial question of the relationship between individual lives and the relational networks of biodiversity, or what might be described as the planetary predicament. In your book, Depeche, the landscapes of specialized learning imprint themselves ever so delicately and deftly on the landscapes of everyday living. I want to start at a point where these landscapes intersect. You yourself have spoken about the landscapes and geographies of your autobiographical and intellectual histories, Calcutta, Canberra, and Chicago. You once wrote beautifully of a creek on the Canberra ANU campus that brought to mind a Bengali poem and the blending of nostalgia that led you to think of a home you had never had and a time yet to come. Tell us a little bit about this moment and about your intellectual journey. For me, first of all, thank you for this wonderful introduction. Thanks to the JLF team for organizing this. And uh, <clears throat> it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be in conversation with, with you, which we've now carried on for more than two decades, actually, as I think about it. It is, it is, it is wonderful to uh, continue our conversation. Um, and thanks for that introduction to the book. So let me just say this um, in explaining the how I how my journey brought me to this problem of planetary climate change uh, was really goes back to my uh, to what was missing in my growing up in Calcutta and what the experience of living in Canberra uh, added to my sensibilities. So, I mean, you know, Calcutta, like Bombay, it's, I mean, we don't have the sea and it's uh, entirely built up. By the time I was growing up, the city had already suffered um, uh, the partition of West Bengal and a lot of refugee families, including part of my own family, uh, had come from what became East Pakistan. And growing up in the built up city, the only exposure to what you might call nature, uh, was the river, which we don't, we didn't see every day, and some, you know, local artificially built lakes and parks. Uh, but but Bengali literature was full of nature, as a result of which, and that has an interesting reason because most Bengali writers actually did not come from Calcutta. You know, they came from Mufasil towns, they came from the countryside, and brought their entire childhood experience of growing up with. Uh, kind of in rural surroundings into uh, the Bengali novel, into Bengali poetry. And uh, so the nature I knew was in words and then on, on screen. And when I came to Canberra, which, you know, you, and you could not think of a city more unlike Calcutta, right? I mean, Calcutta had 
they're teeming millions, as you would think. Canberra had 200,000 people. And what the Australians call the bush, uh, sort of their version of uh, the forest or the woods. It, 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 the city was so planned that the bush runs through it. From any neighborhood, you, can, you just go a few steps and you're in the hills, uh, you know, sh sh small, short hills, but beautiful in their own way. And that creek in, in ANU that you refer to called Sullivan's Creek, um, it always, it, it sort of joins one of the rivers. It comes out of the lake and then joins one of the rivers. And it always had ducklings and, you know, geese and their families uh, nested among reeds. And it reminded me of uh, particular poems by a very immortal Bengali poet called Jibarananda Dash, who was from Borishal in, in East Bengal. But so, I fell in love with that nature uh, in and around Canberra uh, through my love of Bengali literature, really. It's it sort of, in a, in a bizarre and ersatz way, Australia gave me the nature I'd never had. And the nature I, I, I had in Australia was really not Australian nature as Australians would have seen, seen it. It was like compensating for the nature I'd never been in touch with, right? I mean, that's where I learned to swim, uh, in in creeks and in rivers, um, you know, um, we go for we we'll go out with friends with Australian friends on midnight, you know, to look at darkness, to look at the waters in the darkness, and all those kind of experience to listen to birds. Um, so Canberra gave me something I'd never had in growing up in Calcutta, but something for which Calcutta had also prepared me something that Calcutta prepared me to love in my own way through its literature, literary and cinematic uh, heritage. And uh, what happened was in 2003, when Australia was already in the middle of a big drought, a devastating series of fires, which they call bushfire, we might call them wildfires, destroyed not only 300 houses in the city, it destroyed about some tens of, or maybe 25 human lives, but it destroyed all the nature spots. Thousands of animals died. And suddenly, all those spots I used to love visiting, going back from Chicago every year, looked like scenes out of Mad Max, or you know, one of those nightmarish uh, Hollywood uh, uh, imagination. And I was devastated. I felt so bereft of something I'd loved. And I remember, you know, uh, after a couple of years when the grass came back and it was looking green, I sat down, two of my Australian friends, and I said to them, I have to sing a Tagore song for you, a Bengali song, which is all about grass. Tagore is a wonderful yeah. song, a kind of almost a, a hymn to grass, to the glory of grass. And I sat them down and I sing, sang it because, and, and I translated it, you know, inefficiently and badly as, as I was singing it. But... I had a tremendous sense of loss. So I asked, and I knew from having been in Australia, from having read about Australian history, that Australia has a natural cycle of bushfires because the gum trees need those fires. So long yes. before they were humans, the continent would be up in flames because the gum trees needed such fires for their regeneration. But my Australian friends and environmental historians kept telling me, but you know, Dipesh, this is not the ordinary fires we have. This is not an ordinary drought, this is climate change. And I said, what is climate change? <laughs> While scientists have been talking about climate change for decades, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I had barely heard, heard the expression. And I began to read up. Huh? And when I, I began to read up on climate change. Huh? And as I was reading the science, I found that the scientists were saying that humans, thanks to their numbers, their technologies, their... Uh, domination of certain form of animal life, like the animals we keep to farm or to eat, and even uh, the, the kind of animals, wild animals, urban animals that depend on us for their survival, like urban squirrels in, in America, right? Which they would be eaten up by foxes or coyotes if we didn't take this. And I suddenly realized that there is a kind of an industrial bio complex that dominates, that not only really dominates the order of life, causing maybe the beginnings of, a, of the sixth great extinction, but also warming up the seas, acidifying the oceans, 
creating a crisis in the web of life by you know if the oceans warm up then plankton's die if plankton's die we don't get the oxygen we need uh, if the oceans become very acidic then shell forming little forms of life get destroyed and then the crisis moves up the food chain uh, once you begin to affect the very uh, basis of it and they were saying that human beings have become a geological agent and you know i'd been brought up on lefty uh, on a healthy diet of lefty ideologies in calcutta uh, which found expression in my participation and work in subaltern studies and i was a person who was concerned with human rights democracy anti colonialism you know uh, fight for um, the equal distribution of wealth or egalitarian distribution of wealth you know i was i was a person of that kind and the word agent had a particular provenance in that in that sort of historiography because you know agency and interest are two english words that originally i think were created in the domain of commerce but then eventually became part of our political vocabulary interest and an agency an agency had come to stand for a kind of a lockean notion of a person who would be you claimed autonomy the autonomous capability to capability to project yourself out into the world right kind of to make purposeful interventions in the world and so we were all about giving agency to peasants giving agency to subalterns you know acknowledging the agency of women in creating their own histories a geological agent is nothing like that i mean there the word agent means something like the newtonian idea of force so when i read further into the literature they were explaining the scientists were explaining what they meant by it they said look our impact on the planet is such that it's like the impact that the asteroid strike which wiped off the dinosaurs dinosaurs had on the history of life because we are capable of creating the sex six feet extinction or we are like a huge volcanic eruption we have also become the biggest earth moving agent on the both the land surface of the planet as well as on the continent itself so we move move more earth around than all the rivers do taken together so you know this idea that that you and i have our individual lives our phenomenological experience of the world our commitment to certain values that you and i share uh which have been part of post colonial criticism and and theorizing that we have this life but we also have a collective life that is not accessible to us experientially you know with scientists were kind of making available cognitive and of course then you begin to have once it's available at a cognitive domain you begin to have also an affective response to what you learn right it's not like uh, yeah. you have no affective so it's really it's really out of this coming together of a sense of doubleness of our times uh, that we are both part of this the present of the human historical time as well as the present of some kind of a geological period that they were calling the anthropocene right it's out of it's really out of this sense of falling being thrown into this doubleness that my first questions about climate change arose my questions as a humanist as a humanist historian and homi i may have told you this story my first response because bangla is still my first language was my first instinct was to take my sense of surprise and my questions back to my bengali friends so i wrote it up in i wrote an essay in bengali uh, about uh, what became eventually the four theses essay in english so and uh, and it sank without a trace <laughs> it just what was interesting in calcutta they said it's interesting but not our problem and i just finished telling this story and then i came back to Cal- chicago and and i was then on the editorial uh, uh, part of the editorial board of the committee or whatever they call it of critical inquiry and and tom mitchell the editor came to me and said we are short of articles do you have something and i said yeah i've got this thing that i can write up and then i wrote it up in english and people were interested <laughs> outside of calcutta outside of india <laughs> Dipesh, yes, uh, I, this is fascinating, and I'm so grateful to you for giving us the contours of your life as part of the contours of your thinking. Uh, I just want to say one thing: that there are ways of thinking about agency that are right. relational, 
uh, effective relational and are not simply uh, uh, confined, I think, to a more uh, anthropocenic um, autonomy. If I, I just wanted to say that uh, in relation to, but I want to take this somewhere else, somewhere quite different from where I had planned to go. I'd planned to mm -hmm. go from the bushfire to the pandemic. We'll come sure. to the pandemic. But sure. I want to ask you this. Why is it that the human affective and ethical imagination uh, is compelled to destroy the relationality in the sense of agency in which I mean it, the relationality yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it depends upon to sustain life, whether it's water, whether it's, whether it's uh, um, chlorophyll, whether it's oxygen, why does it act against itself? Mm -hmm. Is that a kind of doubleness too? And is this like the gum trees? Why do we expect human beings to have this? And I ask this uh, as a devil's advocate. What is it maybe the destruction principle in a way the gum trees need to destroy themselves to, mm -hmm. to, to reinvent themselves? Why should we? Dim why should human beings not have that same kind of uh, motivation? After you know, after millennia, to destroy themselves. Why would the great extinction not itself be a quote unquote natural phenomenon? I'd never thought about this until I just heard you. No, it's, it's, it's so asking. interesting. It's so interesting you ask this question. It's it's a very very rich question, Homi. So if you'll give me a few a little bit of time to oh, unpack time your question, no, 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 because it, the question is you've posed a beautiful question, and I think there are layers to it. You know, it's like an onion. So what, what you, you need to peel it off. Um, mm. First of all, first of all, I have to grant you the legitimacy of the question. I mean, why indeed? Uh, should humans be any different? In fact, one of the interesting things is that humans otherwise, specialist humans who have studied evolution, have always acknowledged that since all species go extinct after a while, there's no reason why humans wouldn't go extinct. But there's at the same time this doubleness. So there is this knowledge at a cognitive domain having, when you know that we are a form of life connected to other forms of life, they go uh, out, why wouldn't we go out? But at the same time, think back to Hannah Arendt's uh, The Human Condition, which she wrote um, sort of, you know, sort of in, in, the, in the shadow, as it were, of the Russian Sputnik having been uh, launched, right? And, and I, I mention her because she's such an astute thinker. I mean, she is one of the thinkers who uh, really have survived uh, uh, into our uh, very well, in, uh, if you've aged very well, much better than even I would say Marx you know, in many ways. Um, but think of what her response at the end of that. Book. Don't say that in Calcutta very loudly, although maybe no. now it's good. <laughs> no, perhaps not. But, but, just... but Calcutta Marxists have, have sorted me so many times that I now know that I have nine lives. <laughs> so, so maybe I'm on my ninth one, but let me say this. Not, not the sixth extinction, but the ninth no, one. No, the ninth one. <laughs> in my yes, let, no, let no, I'm very this. interested in Arendt, as you know, and a bright Ar about Yeah, absolutely. But see, yeah. think of that passage in the book. So when she realizes that humans being have are moving spaceward, they've kind of lifted this object up into space beyond the atmosphere, she writes... A very her response is fascinating. On the one hand, she says, well, this might ensure the survival of the human species. So this might, because we can go to other, we can colonize other uh, heavenly bodies. So this might actually take us out of the Darwinian view of life, right? While other species, this is what our intelligence. Is. But she says, the trade-off is that the price you pay is what she called earth alienation, because you are earthlings trying to live without the earth. And what we are actually left with is more the point about earth alienation today, because we don't have the optimism that she had. But, but, the, the, but the point I'm trying to make is that when you read climate scientists on the climate crisis or earth system scientists on earth system, 
because they're both scientists and human beings, just as Hannah Arendt was both an analyst and a human being, it's not like they're without affect about what they're discovering. And the affect is very existential. It immediately raises the question, will human beings survive? Can human civilization survive? So they come up with questions like, is a high-tech civilization destined to abort itself? Is it always, I mean, we don't have any other examples, but, but, but can we manage this crisis? Okay. But so I'm saying that the science gives rise to deeply, profoundly existential questions. That is questions to do with human existence in the scientists themselves. And, and, and see, you asked the, the second layer of your question, which is very profound and, and very pertinent and very important, which is that thanks to the sciences, we now know that we are profoundly connected to other forms of life. Homie, think of even the vaccinations, the, the, the medical trials we all normally have for new medicines, right? If there were no connections between your body and a rat's body, why would you try out cancer medication on rats first? Mm -hmm. So we have known about these connectivities for a very long time. But you know, Homie, the human tendency is to both acknowledge and disavow this connectivity at the same time. And uh, so I, I now have a thought, which, I, which is not in the book, where, but it's a formulation, which really came to my head after I received a wonderful email from a former student uh, who is now a professor of history uh, in America called Arvind Dilangovan, a Tamil, young Tamil person who did his PhD with me, who read the book and wrote to me saying, you know, I now realize his mother sadly is gone. He said, oh, every time my mother wrote me a letter, the first line in Tamil, I forget the Tamil, would always say, I am well physically, that I'm, I'm not ill. I hope you are well too. And then it would go into family drama and all kinds of things that mothers would talk to the sons about. But he said, but that first line was really saying, I know I'm immersed in a, I swim in a sea of microbes, <laughs> both outside and inside myself. But none of these microbes have caused me what I call as a human being illness. And I hope you are also swimming well in this tree of microbes. So in a way, so I, I actually say that, that the, the deep history is part, usually part of the human fatigue utterance. You know, you and I meet and I say, isn't it a wonderful day? And then we, then we say, okay, what happened in the committee meeting yesterday? <laughs> but to say it isn't a wonderful day is to appreciate the work, the sun, the winds, the clouds, the light, the trees have been doing around us, right? So you kind of acknowledge the planetary and you know that it, 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 is, it is related to how you feel about that day. It, it gives you, it makes you feel upbeat. It makes you feel sad. You were just showing us outside the window, the overcast nature of the day. That's the planetary, right? And, but that's part of the fatigue. And, and normally we've carried on human life and existence on the basis, on the assumption that this would be part of the fatigue. Philosophically, the fatigue is what you would, what a Husserl would actually describe as the givenness of the world. Yes. Right? Or as Wittgenstein, you know, this question from Wittgenstein, which I discuss in my book a little bit, it's a, it's a question he asks in, in the book on uncertainty, where he says, when I look at a building as a human being, I ask, how old is it? Why don't I ask of, the, of a mountain? And that's because the mountain lives and dies on a humongous scale of time. So beyond my human sense of time that I take the mountain and the seashores for granted. So again, one of the instances of the fatigue acknowledgement of the planetary, I think are the, are the travel books we read before visiting Spain or visiting places with sea beaches, you know, because the sea beaches have been carved by a restless planet. You know, in that national park near Bar Harbor, and you're close to Bar Harbor, Bar Harbor now, a, a young geologist, uh, Sarah, who teaches at the, at the uh, College of the Atlantic, uh, her colleague, Netta, and they took uh, Rochana and me out into the national park. And Sarah and I were standing on a boulder on, on a beach, you know, on a rock. And she said to me, Dipesh, you know, what was there? between your, the sole of your feet and the rock was taken away by the ice when it moved 12,000 years ago. And sure enough, when I, then I, when I looked back on the rock, I could see that the 
ice had scraped the rock and had left striations on the rock. The rock was striated by the ice. Normally, I wouldn't have seen it. So normally, that geological time is so big for us that we think of the planet as stable. So a, a travel book will tell you, oh, you're going to Bar Harbor, go to this beach. And humans would, for generations, go and visit that beach, like in three or four generations. We will tell each other, go and visit that beach, because that beach seems stable. But if humans could live for 20,000 years, the world would seem absolutely restless. So there's, a, there's this kind of this kind of human time which cocoons us into a certain sense and a sensibility about what is every day about us. And, and that's why I was saying that the fatigue has traditionally been about acknowledging this planetary as given, is givenness, and not bothering about it until it bothers us, you know, like, Today, the question, to, if you asked an Indian friend, how are you? It's a significant question. It's not a, just a fatic utterance, right? So, to, so, so philosophically, one might say what we have lost or stand in the danger of losing is this sense that the world has a certain kind of givenness for us. But humans have survived and evolved, I think, to go back to your question, into the doubleness of their phenomenology of the world, the everyday sense of the world has been based on the given, on this assumption that it's given. But our knowledge has been telling us for a long time that we are connected, we are connected. And now, because we have precipitated a kind of a crisis that has to do with the connectivity, has to do with the fact that, that we depend on <coughs> planktons producing fresh oxygen for the atmosphere. We depend on the forest surviving and not cutting them down so that viruses and bad guts can't come to us. So we have, through, our, through the expansion of our flourishing, through the expansion of our numbers, expansion of our technology, expansion of the human realm, we have now produced a crisis that brings back the message of connectivity as a warning, as a lesson to be learned. Whereas before it was just an inert piece of knowledge we didn't, we didn't actively think about it, us humanists, I mean. Uh, Dipu, yes, I, I absolutely see that and I love the uh, description of the fatigue. Uh, could I now speak from the, uh, starting with Arendt, sure. you talked about the human predicament. I'm taking you to the right to the end of a text that is hugely relevant, I think, in our own times which is the origins of totalitarianism. Right. Um, and there she says, again, talks about the doubleness in a kind of a strange combination of Hegel, Marx and Lacan, which is interesting right. where she says, in an interconnected world, in an interconnected world, uh, barbarism does not come from elsewhere. It always comes from within yeah. to reduce the lives of people uh, and to reduce the lives of the earth itself, of the planet, to, this, to forms of, de of, of, of denigration, robbing it of a kind of dignity, not the kind of yeah. Kantian notion of dignity, but dignity yeah. as a form of recognition, as a form of recognition of your place in the world. Right. So right. this doubleness, this... The, 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 the barbarism that always comes from within civilization or within civility yeah. uh, somehow has, I would suggest, not allowed us a, a kind of a, a, a fatic contentment or a, a being there. Because, for instance, in religious and theological thinking, in thinking around superstition, thinking around obviously the sciences of geology and uh, archaeology. But even when the gardener tills the soil and sees that in one part of the soil, the tomatoes will grow yeah. and in another part they will wither. Right. Or when winemakers in France can, because of a microclimate, the whole nature of trade, the whole taste of the wine, the affective nature changes. Isn't, aren't these intimations uh, of, uh, of a non-settled everyday? 
yeah. are very much part yeah. of our of our lives. And in fact, when you said, uh, and and this is of course a joke, but or this is meant to be a joke, when you said that you know we'd say to each other, "How are you?" as we swim in an ocean of microbes, I thought there is no less fatic nation than Britain, where every day the climate is <laughs> What an awful morning! What a dark day! <laughs> right. So I, I just, I just thought so keep I complaining about planetarity. <laughs> but I would throw that in to, to, to yeah. sort of return to this issue. Yeah. In yeah. connectivity, both the gift and relatedness, the gift of 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 human and planetary life. Yeah. But is that very connectivity? It's destruction. Just to go deeper into this notion, yeah. no, of I think without a kind of sublation or transcendence, as with Hegel or even with Marx. Yeah, no. Since so there, again, homie. So you know, the it, the it, it, it's a complex and and, it's, and wonderful question. So uh, let me again uh, tease out a few things. Um, Please. Uh, so first of all. It's absolutely true that in my life, even as recently as the 1950s, when I was growing up as a young boy in a neighborhood of Calcutta. So we first lived in a rented place uh, in Park Circus, which was a more built up part of the city. And then my father could afford to buy the place where he could afford to buy a piece of land to build a house on was on the outskirts. And a a, a neighborhood which is now part of the city, but was then still being run by a municipality, right outside the Calcutta Corporation. So I grew up with ponds and uh, agricultural land very close by the soccer ground on which I played soccer as a schoolboy. Was still called Khetir Mart. Khet is yeah. Kheti, right? Sort of yeah. where cultivation takes place. Yes, it's still called the the field where they used to cultivate. So there's a memory of you know that, and. So I grew up around snakes, around frogs, around jackals in that part of Calcutta. And you have to be, you had to be respectful. Like when a pond got over flooded and snakes came into your household and people that people, elders will tell us, oh, this is not a poisonous snake. You know, this is just an ordinary water snake. It, it can bite you, it won't kill you, but that one is. So you, you grew up with a certain, you know, in the book, what I call reverence, a certain sense of respect and awe mixed in for, you know, for other forms of life. So you knew they were around you. Um, but the more urbanized cities get, the more built up cities get, we also both destroy these forms of life and they become, they become distant from these forms of life. And we, we lose even that everyday sense of um, crisis ridden sense of dwelling. You know, I mean, as Heidegger says that the dwelling always carries with it a kind of sense of security. Which is never given to you. Right? I mean, even today in Chicago and I'm, I'm just in Boston too, you know, like the moment winter comes or summer comes, I mean, there are other creatures that want to come and you live in your house. You know, sometimes you don't mind them, sometimes you do mind them. If it's, if it's a mouse, you don't want it. But it is also looking for shelter and, and food. And Heidegger's beautiful description that human dwelling is this constant battle with outside and with other creatures that want to share in your dwelling. It's because dwelling has to do with the sense of security. But what I wanted to say though, that what's fascinating about the climate science is that it also speaks of the role that <clears throat> uh, different parts of the world play in creating the planetary climate system, that is the climate system mm -hmm. of the whole planet. Parts of the world where human beings have never dwelled, for instance, the deep seas, the continent, the deep earth, uh, oceanic currents, the the planktons in the seas. So in some ways, um, climate science, because of its scale, is already talking about a system which you can't quite completely know simply by basing yourself on what humans experience. But still, I come, I, I come back to the doubleness, the doubleness of the question, the, the barbarism, where it comes from. So here, one needs to make a distinction. For instance, the indigenous societies, which fundamentally don't make a human-animal distinction. So, you, you know, you can have indigenous societies that Philip Descola talks about, for instance, where people would eat monkeys, but monkeys are also con considered a kind of kin, skins that you can eat 
to a limited degree. In fact, there's a fascinating story he tells where when a tribal man gets hold of a gun and he kills more monkeys than he would normally with a, with a bow and arrow. And the next day, his wife gets bitten by a snake. He thinks he's being punished for being greedy about how many kins he could eat. I mean, wonderful to have a system where you can eat some of your kins. <laughs> we, you know, I don't, I don't have, I haven't had the advantage of that system. But it's it's fascinating to look at some of the indigenous worlds where this connectedness is acknowledged, even in kinship terms. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say also a was that form of, a form of cannibalism. Well, because see, if you don't I mean, take the human, you, I, it, that you can, it, but you you can eat your own kind. Yes, but but only up to but but a particular you don't eat another human being, but you can eat the second cousins like monkeys, right? So you don't the eat Philippe your. Descola, the Philip Descola very interesting <laughs> point can actually be extended in a rather <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. Our sense. <laughs> yeah. Going again, the barbarism of civility, even <laughs> right? <in the> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So there's things to be learned from it. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is that there's one side that kind of story but the, also the fact is that the indigenous societies mostly most of them, all of them supported small number of human beings but what happens in the human story is that we are you know we it takes us almost 300,000 years to get to the number 1 billion so in 1900 we are 1. 1.5 billion in 2000 we are 6 so something happens in the 20th century and beyond when you know our numbers grow we are able to sustain more people we are able to um, uh, save more lives. I mean, think of the role of antibiotics. I'm, I'm a beneficiary of it. Uh, and we are able to sustain more lives. So that even the poor have longer lives, even though they have miserable lives. Right? So you have the situation of mass poverty, you know, because you can create masses of human beings. And therefore, uh, we should not... So while there is the question of the existentially, this you can pose the question phenomenologically of connectivity and barbarism and but I'm just introducing a little bit of historical element to it in the sense that that in the last 150 years or 120 years or whatever, uh, things have really shifted dramatically and human the human realm has expanded. So, you know, I was reading somewhere that if we destroy 25% of the forest cover, the present forest, existing forest cover, we'll be in danger. We're up at 17 and, we are de and destruction of forests is a major reason for the pandemic and for what Anthony Fauci and his colleague David Moran call entering an era of pandemics, then pandemics will happen with more frequency. So there's something to be, something historical to be added to the existential question, I mean, the, the structural right. question you asked, right? Um, right. No, yeah. that's, a, that's a very good point. We have to conclude, um, my dearest Dupesh, and I just want to um, mention a few thoughts in conclusion. First of all, thank you, as always, for continuing our conversation thank as you. we do a dust style, a dust style on the telephone or when we meet, so that there is this continual flowing in. You know, as you described the creek, we flow into each other. Yeah. And, I, and for me, it's, of course, a great liberation. Beyond the creek lies the ocean. And thank you for that. I wanted to draw attention to the fact that scale has been such an important part of our discussion today. The scale of destruction, the scale of population, the scale of consumption, but also think about it not only as scale in that sense, but think about it also as the scales of justice. Tip, yeah. the, the, you know, putting the, like the shopkeeper <clears throat> in India, Put, you know, the little the pieces of lead to make sure that there is some kind of balance in scale. And so stones. A very important issue. And, <laughs> yeah. That I hope remains for another conversation, either here or elsewhere, on the whole problem that obsesses me at the moment, which is not simply the problem of birth, but the problem of death. Yeah. How, how the notion of dignity, the notion of well-being is calculated at the point of death and destruction and, uh, and not only at the moment of uh, birth like in Hannah Arendt where the notion of natality is the right. central. And I think that in our conversation somewhere 
has been haunting this this yeah. this question of death. And finally, uh, if I may just add another question that I would love at some point to take up with you is the way in which the political sphere and particularly our current ethno-populist uh, 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 leaders, but also much before that, for them, how nature is a complete plaything. It is no more than a market. And that goes for human nature too. So my dearest Dipesh, I want to thank you for being in conversation. I'm dedicating this to you. I sit up overlook in Maine, overlooking these beautiful waters, but soon we will be back on the telephone, possibly later today. And I thank you for your book. I thank you for your friendship. And I thank you for the time we spent together. Thank you, Zomi. Everything you say, I repeat from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thanks to Sanjay and his team again for making this conversation possible. Back to the maestro, Sanjay. Thank you, Professor Baba. Thank you, Professor Chakravarti, for the brilliant conversation on climate change and karma. I think the snake biting was indeed karma. And as Dr. Baba said, the scale of destruction and justice, none of this can really be done in one session. And we need, as I keep telling Professor Baba, a series of discussions on these issues, which are all interconnected. Thank you all for being such a great audience and listening in. We'll see you next week on 2nd July at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. On JLF's first edition, we launch Themima Anam's new book, The Startup Wife. And at 8.30 p.m., we have Owning Science, Owning Knowledge, Jia Raghavendra, Chandrakant Laharia, Arundhati Das Gupta, and Raja Highfield in conversation with Vikram Chandra. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe, stay double-masked. Thank you. Thank you. times uh, during COVID when we're all sitting at home, it's, it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. In the pandemic, we are digitally political festival and I think that we are not in front of us, we are talking in front of us, but we are able to feel that thousands of people are connected to us, we are listening to us. People who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world. We were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information.